The moon landing one's my favorite. Really? I, I, got, I got balls deep in that for years. I was com completely So you convinced. think they did not go to the moon? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think that anymore. Five, four, three, two, one, liftoff. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Neil Armstrong's legendary step onto the moon left the world in awe, his words capturing the monumental achievement of mankind. Yet, there's a hidden message, a secret unveiled by Joe Rogan, that piques curiosity about the moon's mysteries. Armstrong's life, from his early days enchanted by flight near the Wright brothers' birthplace, to his daring feats as a NASA astronaut, paints a vivid picture of a man destined for the stars. What secrets did Armstrong carry from his lunar exploration? Join us as we unveil the most captivating secrets witnessed by Armstrong during his moon landing. Armstrong's horrifying moon revelation. The phrase, one small step for a man, one giant leap for humanity, will always be remembered. Neil Armstrong is known as the biggest hero of America's space achievements for being the first person to walk on the moon. He also left us with a mysterious message before he passed away. Joe Rogan, a well-known podcaster, thinks he has solved it. What did Joe Rogan find out about traveling to the moon? What secrets has he uncovered? We're going to dive into what Joe Rogan believes about the message Neil Armstrong left behind, titled, The First Man to Walk on the Moon. Everyone knows who Neil Armstrong is. He made history as the first human to step on the moon's surface. Neil Armstrong was born on August 5, 1930, not far from where the Wright brothers had their workshop. His parents were Viola Louise and Stephen Koenig Armstrong. His family had roots in Germany, England, Ireland, and Scotland. Neil had a younger sister named June and a brother named Dean. His dad worked as an auditor for the state of Ohio, and because of his job, the family moved a lot. They lived in 16 different places over 14 years. Neil was destined to fly. His passion for flying started very early. When he was just two years old, his dad took him to see the Cleveland Air Races. By the time he was five or six, he went on his first plane ride in Warren, Ohio. He and his dad flew in a Ford Trimotor, also known as the Tin Goose. Neil got his pilot's license when he was just 16, before he even had a license to drive a car. In 1947, he went to Purdue University with a scholarship from the Navy to study how to design airplanes. As part of his Navy scholarship, he was trained to be a fighter pilot in Florida. His time at college was interrupted by the Korean War. During the war, he flew 78 missions in a jet fighter called the F-9 Panther. This jet was one of the first to be able to take off from an aircraft carrier. After Neil Armstrong completed his university studies, he started working for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. This organization would later be known as NASA, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. In 1958, this quiet young man from Ohio quickly became famous as one of the bravest and most skilled test pilots at NASA's Flight Research Center, which today is named in his honor. Stationed at the Edwards Air Force Base in California, Armstrong spent seven years as a test pilot. During this time, he flew over 200 different types of aircraft, pushing them to their limits in terms of speed and how high they could go. Among these was the extraordinary X-15, which he flew high above the California desert. In one of his flights, he reached speeds over 4,000 miles per hour and took the X-15, a plane with a long, thin nose, right to the brink of outer space. Armstrong's incredible skill and calmness as a test pilot played a crucial role in the success of NASA's first Mercury astronauts. Soon, he would join their ranks. In 1962, Armstrong was selected for NASA's astronaut training program in Houston. During this period, his personal life faced a tragedy when his wife Janet's and his second child, a two-year-old daughter named Karen, passed away from a brain tumor that couldn't be treated. To cope with his immense grief, Armstrong threw himself into his work, focusing on preparations for the Gemini program. This program was NASA's next step in their ambitious plan to reach the moon. In 1966, Armstrong was picked as the lead pilot for the Gemini 8 mission. This mission was notable because it was NASA's first attempt at docking two spacecraft in orbit, a maneuver fraught with danger and complexity. Armstrong and his co-pilot, David Scott, managed to successfully dock with an unmanned spacecraft. However, shortly after, 
their spacecraft started spinning out of control because of a broken thruster. Armstrong was able to regain control by using the re-entry control system, but they had to cut the mission short and make an emergency splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. It was a narrow escape, but Armstrong's quick thinking and calm demeanor saved them. Armstrong's most significant mission was still to come, one that would cement his place in history. He was appointed the commander of Apollo 11, the very first manned mission to land on the moon. How did humans manage to reach the moon? What challenges did they face on their journey through space? What could have gone wrong and what actually did? We're about to delve into the incredible story of the flight to the moon. The initial team for this monumental mission consisted of Commander Neil Armstrong, Command Module Pilot Jim Lovell, and Lunar Module Pilot Buzz Aldrin, who were originally the backup crew for Apollo 9. Lovell and Aldrin had experience flying together during the Gemini 12 mission. Due to some delays in the design and manufacturing of the Lunar Module, there was a switch in the prime and backup crews for Apollo 8 and Apollo 9, making Armstrong's team the backup for Apollo 8. Following NASA's usual pattern for crew rotation, it became expected that Armstrong would lead Apollo 11. This decision set the stage for one of humanity's most significant achievements. Step back to see how Neil Armstrong began his path to being the first to step on the moon. The Apollo 11 trio, work over friends. There was a significant adjustment in the crew lineup. Michael Collins, who was set to be the command module pilot for Apollo 8, started having issues with his legs. The doctors found out he had a bone problem between two of his spine bones, which needed an operation to fix. Jim Lovell took his place for the Apollo 8 mission. Once Collins got better, he joined Armstrong and the team as the CMP for Apollo 11. During this shuffle, Fred Hayes stepped in as a backup lunar module pilot, and Buzz Aldrin took over as the backup CMP for the Apollo 8 mission. This made Apollo 11 the second time an American space mission was crewed entirely by astronauts who had been to space before. The first time was Apollo 10, and then it happened again with STS-26 in 1988. Deke Slayton, one of the people in charge, gave Armstrong the choice to have Aldrin replaced by Lovell because some people found Aldrin hard to work with. Armstrong didn't have any problems with Aldrin, but he took a day to think about it anyway. Ultimately, he decided against the change, feeling Lovell should get to lead his own mission. The main crew of Apollo 11 didn't share the kind of easygoing friendship seen in the Apollo 12 team. Instead, they built a respectful, professional relationship. Armstrong was known for keeping to himself, but Collins, who also preferred his own company, admitted he didn't respond well to Aldrin's efforts to get closer. Aldrin and Collins thought of their group as friendly, but not close, like amiable strangers. Armstrong didn't quite agree, saying every team he was part of got along just fine. On July 16, 1969, the Saturn V rocket blasted off from Florida. This event captured the attention of millions of viewers all around the world through their television screens. Four days later, Armstrong and Aldrin left the command module, climbed into the lunar module named Eagle, and got everything ready to land on the moon. At precisely 1744, Eagle left the command module, named Columbia. Collins, left alone in Columbia, checked Eagle from his position to make sure it wasn't damaged and that its landing gear was set up right. Armstrong humorously noted that the Eagle now had its wings as they began their descent. During the descent, Armstrong and Aldrin noticed they were moving across the moon's landmarks a bit too quickly, being ahead by two or three seconds. This meant they were going to land further west than planned, missing their intended landing spot by miles because they were traveling faster than expected. The issue might have been caused by maskins, areas on the moon's surface that have more mass and create stronger gravity, potentially changing Eagle's flight path. Gene Kranz, the flight director, guessed that the problem could have been due to extra air pressure inside the docking tunnel, or perhaps because of the way Eagle spun around. Just five minutes after they started lowering the lunar module towards the moon, and when they were about 6,000 feet up in the air, the crew faced their first big tech hiccup. The LM's brain, a computer, started beeping with warning signals, codes 1201 and 1202. These weren't simple beeps. They meant the computer was overwhelmed, trying to do too many things at once and couldn't keep up. Back on Earth, in the control room, a computer expert named Jack Garman quickly figured out that it was still okay to keep going down to the moon. He told this to Steve Bales, the guidance officer, 
who then relayed the reassuring message to the astronauts. Margaret Hamilton, who was in charge of the Apollo flight computer programming back at the MIT lab, remembered that when Neil Armstrong glanced back outside, he saw a problem. The computer was aiming to land them in a risky spot filled with big rocks, right next to a huge crater 300 feet across, known as West Crater. Armstrong didn't stick to the plan. He took over some of the controls himself, trying to find a safer place to land. He thought about landing near the rocky area to grab some cool rock samples, but scrapped that idea because they were moving sideways too fast. Buzz Aldrin was his co-pilot, reading off the speed and direction while Armstrong steered the eagle. Getting closer, now just 107 feet above the moon's surface, Armstrong saw their fuel was running low. He was set on landing as soon as he could find a safe spot. Then, at about 250 feet up, he spotted a potential landing site, but noticed it had a crater too. Dodging that, he finally found a smoother spot. Now only 100 feet away from landing, with just 90 seconds of fuel left. The dust flying up from the moon made it hard to see and judge how fast they were moving. However, Armstrong spotted some big rocks through the dust cloud and used them to gauge their speed. A signal light turned on, telling Aldrin that a long sensor hanging from the LM's foot had touched the moon's surface, hinting they were moments away from landing. Aldrin announced this contact light signal. Normally, Armstrong should have immediately turned off the engine to prevent any risk of explosion from the engine's exhaust bouncing back from the lunar ground. But in the heat of the moment, he forgot. Three seconds later, they landed safely, and then Armstrong remembered to shut down the engine. Go further into Armstrong's moon adventure, where what we know gets tested. What will we find? Was the moon landing real? For Apollo 11's big moment, they had to use a special kind of TV technology that didn't work with the TVs everyone had at home. To show what was happening on the moon to people on Earth, they displayed the moon's footage on a special monitor, and then another TV camera filmed that monitor. It was like showing a video of a video, which made the picture a lot fuzzier. The signal first reached Earth at a place called Goldstone in the United States, but a station closer to Canberra in Australia, called Honeysuckle Creek Tracking Station, picked it up clearer. Not long after, they switched to an even better receiver, the Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia, which helped despite some tech hiccups and iffy weather. Black and white videos of the astronauts stepping onto the moon for the first time got sent back to Earth, and over 600 million people watched it live. They saved copies of this historic broadcast, but the very first, clearer version from the moon got lost over time because NASA reused the tapes for other things. When the astronauts came back to Earth, their capsule, Columbia, landed upside down in the ocean. Luckily, it was flipped back the right way in 10 minutes, thanks to some airbags they activated. Then, a diver from a hovering Navy helicopter hooked up a sea anchor to keep it from floating away. Other divers put on extra floaties to make sure it stayed stable in the water and set up rafts so the astronauts could get out safely. On August 13th, the astronauts were treated like heroes in parades in New York and Chicago, where around 6 million people cheered for them. That night in Los Angeles, there was a fancy dinner to celebrate their journey, with important guests like members of Congress, 44 state governors, two chief justices, and ambassadors from 83 countries, all at the Century Plaza Hotel. President Nixon and Vice President Agnew gave each astronaut the Presidential Medal of Freedom as a special honor. On September 16, 1969, the astronauts talked to both parts of Congress. They brought two American flags with them, one for the House of Representatives and one for the Senate, which they had taken all the way to the moon and back. The flag from American Samoa that went to the moon is now in a museum in Pago Pago, the capital of American Samoa. This kicked off a 38-day trip around the world where they visited 22 countries, met lots of leaders, and shared their story. Their globe-trotting tour kicked off in Mexico City and wrapped up in Tokyo. Along the way, they stopped in cities like Bogota, Buenos Aires, Rio de Janeiro, across the Canary Islands, through Europe in places like Madrid, Paris, Amsterdam, all the way up to Oslo, then over to Cologne, Berlin, London, down to Rome, Belgrade, Ankara, across Africa to Kinshasa, over to Tehran, down to Mumbai, Dhaka, across to Bangkok, Darwin, 
Sydney, a hop to Guam, then Seoul, and finally, Tokyo and Honolulu. It was a whirlwind tour, bringing the excitement and achievement of their moon landing to people around the world. The idea that the moon landing in 1969 was not real, and instead a staged event, has been a topic of debate for years. One of the people who has discussed this theory is Joe Rogan, a well-known podcaster. Rogan has talked about how, in the footage of the moon landing, the United States flag seems to wave, as if it's flapping in the wind. However, since there's no air on the moon to cause wind, this raised questions for him. Some people think that to make the flag look like it was moving, it was set up with a wire frame, and possibly even a fan, to create movement, all while being filmed somewhere on Earth, instead of the moon. This idea suggests that NASA planned this elaborate scheme to trick everyone into believing the United States had won the space race against the Soviet Union, which was a big deal at that time. The space race was essentially a competition between the two countries to prove who was more advanced in space exploration. Following this line of thought, some speculate that Neil Armstrong's decision to leave NASA might have been related to the controversy surrounding the moon landing. Adding to the intrigue, a former employee from Rocketdyne, the company responsible for constructing the engine casing of the Saturn V rockets, claimed to have insider knowledge that the moon landing was indeed a fabrication. This employee argued that the flag seen in the moon landing footage was just one piece of evidence among many that the event was staged. Joe Rogan isn't alone in his skepticism. Other conspiracy theorists also doubt the authenticity of the moon landing arguing that the United States staged the entire mission to claim victory in the space race against the Soviet Union. One major point of contention is the photos released by NASA from the moon. Critics ask why no stars are visible in the sky in these pictures. Given the moon's location in space, it stands to reason that stars should be visible in the background of these images. Additionally, in one of the iconic photos from the moon landing, where Buzz Aldrin is featured, Neil Armstrong can be seen reflected in Aldrin's helmet visor. Some observant skeptics have pointed out that Armstrong doesn't appear to be holding a camera, leading to questions about who exactly took the photo. According to official records, only Armstrong and Aldrin were on the moon during the landing, which has led to further speculation and doubts about the legitimacy of the moon landing narrative presented by NASA and the United States government. Jump into the whirlpool of mysteries and talks that circle one of our biggest space trips. What's hidden? Why did Armstrong stay silent? When we look at photos taken during the moon landing, we notice that we can see things that are in the dark. Some people don't believe this should be possible if the sun was the only light source. They think this means there must have been extra lights, like the ones used in movie making, to light up these areas. A well-known picture from the moon has a small rock that seems to have the letter C on it. To some, this looks like a mistake someone made while setting up a fake scene, as if that rock was a prop marked by someone and accidentally left that way for the camera. However, the experts at NASA and other scientists say the C might be a mistake from when the photo was made, like a hair getting in the way, or maybe someone changed the picture later to add the C on purpose. But this has made more people wonder if we can believe what NASA says. Then there's the issue with how the shadows look in the photos. Some shadows from the astronauts aren't the same length, even though they are near each other. People think this might show that the lighting wasn't natural, like from the sun, but made by lights in a studio, and NASA didn't catch this mistake. Some even suggest that to make it look like there's less gravity on the moon, the astronauts were hung up on thin wires, they think NASA filmed them moving around and then played the video slower to make it seem like they were floating. There are folks who have tried to recreate this on their own to show it could be faked. The idea that the moon landing was a hoax isn't new, and some think that Neil Armstrong felt guilty about being part of this hoax, which is why he later left NASA. After their time at NASA, some astronauts like Glenn and Harrison Schmidt from Apollo 17 went into politics. Armstrong had chances to join in too, as both major parties wanted him, but he said no. He had his own beliefs, like thinking the US shouldn't try to control other countries and supporting the rights of states. When he wanted to lead a Boy Scout group at his church in the 1950s, he said he believed in God in his own way, 
which made his very religious mother upset. After coming back from the moon, Armstrong thanked the U.S. Congress and mentioned how the journey let him see the wonders of the universe, hinting at his belief in a higher power. Back in the early 1980s, a story spread saying that Neil Armstrong had become a Muslim. This rumor started because some people thought he heard the Muslim call to prayer while he was on the moon. An Indonesian singer Suhaimi even made a song about it called Gema Suara Adzan di Bulan, which means the resonant sound of the call to prayer on the moon. This song and the story got a lot of attention in Jakarta in 1983, and similar rumors popped up in Egypt and Malaysia too. Because of all this talk, the U.S. government had to step in. In March 1983, they sent out a message to their offices in Muslim countries to clear things up, saying Armstrong had not changed his religion. This mix-up didn't go away quickly and kept coming up for about 30 years. Part of why this rumor seemed believable to some was because Neil Armstrong lived in a place called Lebanon in Ohio, which has the same name as a country in the Middle East where lots of people are Muslim. Apart from all this, Armstrong had a big passion for flying, especially gliders. He loved flying so much that he got a special award from the International Gliding Commission before he even went to the moon. He kept flying these engineless planes even when he was over 70. There was a scary moment in November 1978 when he was working on his farm. He accidentally caught his wedding ring on the wheel of his grain truck, and it ripped off the tip of his finger. He quickly picked up the piece of his finger, put it on ice, and doctors were able to put it back on at a hospital in Louisville, Kentucky. Years later, in February 1991, he had a heart scare while skiing with friends in Aspen, Colorado. He had a mild heart attack but was okay after that. In August 2012, Armstrong had to have a big surgery to fix his heart at a hospital in Cincinnati. It seemed like he was getting better after the surgery, but then he had some serious problems and passed away on August 25th at the age of 82. After he died, President Barack Obama said that Armstrong was one of the greatest American heroes not just in his own time, but in all of history. Obama praised him for achieving something unforgettable for the United States and for all of humanity. Looking back at Armstrong's huge mark on history, how does his story push us to dream bigger? Send a wink to the moon for Neil. Neil Armstrong's family shared their feelings about him, painting a picture of a man who didn't seek the spotlight despite his incredible achievements. Armstrong was a true patriot and served his country in many ways, first as a Navy fighter pilot, then as a test pilot, and finally, making history as an astronaut. His passing was a time of both sadness and reflection, reminding us all of the extraordinary life he led. His family hoped his journey would inspire young people everywhere to chase their dreams, to dare to go beyond what seems possible and to dedicate themselves to something bigger than their own desires. To honor Neil's legacy, his family made a simple request to remember him for his service, his achievements, and his humble nature. They suggested that whenever anyone looks up at the night sky and sees the moon shining back, they should think of Neil Armstrong and wink in his memory. This idea captured the hearts of many, sparking the Twitter hashtag, Wink at the Moon where people from all over shared their moments of winking at the moon in tribute to Armstrong. Buzz Aldrin, another space legend and Armstrong's comrade on the moon, remembered him as the epitome of an American hero and the finest pilot he had ever known. Aldrin expressed a heartfelt regret that they wouldn't be able to mark the 50th anniversary of their lunar landing together in 2019. Michael Collins, the third member of their historic mission, also paid tribute to Armstrong, calling him the best and sharing his profound sense of loss. NASA Administrator Charles Bolden highlighted Armstrong's eternal place in history, asserting that as long as there are history books, Neil Armstrong will be featured prominently. Bolden admired Armstrong for achieving the first small step on a world that wasn't our own, a feat that expanded the horizons of humanity forever. In July 2019, 50 years after humans first landed on the moon, 
news came out about a legal battle involving Neil Armstrong's family. The New York Times shared that Armstrong's family had taken legal steps against Mercy Health Fairfield Hospital, the place where Armstrong passed away. Interestingly, Armstrong's wife, Carol, chose not to be involved in the lawsuit. People say she thought that her husband wouldn't have wanted to sue the hospital. Neil Armstrong is a name that shines brightly in the history of space and science. He wasn't just a man who walked on the moon. He was a trailblazer who contributed greatly to our understanding of aerospace and the universe. In 1978, the National Academy of Engineering welcomed him as a member because of his significant work in aerospace engineering, his role in expanding scientific knowledge, and his daring exploration of space as both a test pilot and an astronaut. And in 2001, the American Philosophical Society recognized his contributions and made him a member. Over the years, Armstrong and his fellow Apollo 11 astronauts were honored with numerous awards. In 1999, the Smithsonian Institution gave them the Langley Gold Medal, one of many accolades highlighting their monumental achievement. On April 18, 2006, NASA presented Armstrong with the Ambassador of Exploration Award, and in 2013, the Space Foundation awarded him the General James E. Hill Lifetime Space Achievement Award. Armstrong's name was also etched into the Aerospace Walk of Honor, the International Space Hall of Fame, the National Aviation Hall of Fame, and the United States Astronaut Hall of Fame. His contributions were formally recognized by the Navy as well, and in a special ceremony aboard the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. On March 10, 2010, attended by fellow astronauts Lovell and Cernan, Armstrong was awarded his Naval Astronaut Badge. To honor his legacy, a lunar crater named Armstrong lies 31 miles, 50 kilometers, from where Apollo 11 landed, and there's also an asteroid named 6,469 Armstrong in his honor. In the United States alone, more than a dozen schools carry his name, teaching children about his legacy and inspiring future generations. But his name isn't just found in schools, streets, buildings, and other places worldwide bear the Armstrong name, celebrating the Apollo missions and Armstrong's contribution to space exploration. His hometown of Wapakoneta honors him with the Armstrong Air and Space Museum, and the Neil Armstrong Airport in New Knoxville, Ohio, is a testament to his enduring influence. The mineral named Armstrongite carries Neil Armstrong's name as a tribute to him. Another mineral, Armalkalite, is partly named after him too, showing how much respect scientists and researchers have for Armstrong's contributions to space and science. In a significant honor from the world of academia, Purdue University, where Armstrong studied, decided to name one of its engineering buildings after him. This building, called the Neil Armstrong Hall of Engineering, was officially opened in October 2007. Armstrong himself was there for the opening, along with 14 other astronauts who also studied at Purdue. This event was a big deal because it showed how much Armstrong and his fellow astronauts mean to the field of engineering and space exploration. In 2014, NASA decided to rename one of its research centers after Armstrong, calling it the NASA Neil A. Armstrong Flight Research Center. This was a way of acknowledging Armstrong's important contributions to aerospace research and his historic role as the first person to walk on the moon. The U.S. Navy also paid tribute to Armstrong by naming a new class of research vessels after him. The first ship in this class was called the RV Neil Armstrong, launched in September 2012. Armstrong's legacy also includes a vast collection of personal items related to his space missions and life. In 2018, his sons decided to auction off some of these items, including his Boy Scout cap, flags, and medals. These auctions were very successful, with people willing to pay millions to own a piece of history connected to Armstrong. The first series of auctions brought in $5.2 million, and by July 2019, the total from the sales reached $16.7 million. 
Some of the most fascinating items sold were pieces of wood from the propeller and fabric from the wing of the Wright Flyer, the first powered aircraft, that Armstrong took with him to the moon. These pieces sold for huge sums, ranging from $112,500 to $275,000 each. Could Neil Armstrong's cryptic message hint at untold truths about our moon? Perhaps secrets beyond our grasp? Share your thoughts, and don't forget to like and subscribe for more revelations.